Good evening. Good to have everyone out on this Thursday night of revival. We trust that you have come with your cup right side up, ready to receive what God has for us tonight. Have you done that? You come expecting him to be here tonight? And uh, I believe he will. I'm trusting so. And let's just keep praying to that endeavor. I appreciate what the Lord has done, but he's, there's still things to be done. And I'm sure he wants to do something even greater than what he already has. And let's, let's just determine that we're going to be obedient and allow him to work uh, through us, through obedience. And I'm sure he'll do something for us. Let's stand tonight. And uh, so good to have it. Brother Hales, pastors up in Fairmount. Let's just lift as he would open this uh, service with prayer tonight. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come to thee tonight, how we thank you for the love of God. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that we have to gather together in this service. And Father, tonight we pray that you just pour out your spirit upon us. We need the help of God tonight. We pray that thou will pour out your blessings upon every student here, upon every person, Lord, that's attending. Oh, we want to welcome thee, Holy Spirit, tonight just to come down upon us in a mighty way. We love you tonight, Lord, and we pray that you bless this school and bless Brother Whitaker and pour out your blessings upon the evangelist as he brings us a message. Oh, our hearts are hungry tonight and our cups are white right side up and we're looking Lord for you to fill them tonight we just want the Holy Ghost to come down upon each one of us Lord tonight and pour out your spirit and we'll praise you for we ask it in Jesus name amen praise the Lord well Psalm 100 verse 4 says enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and that's what I want us to start out doing tonight. Would you take your hymnals and let's turn to 119 and let's sing, I will praise him. And let's choose to praise him from our hearts tonight. 119.
truly grace that we just stand and remain standing and turn over yet. Yeah, let's turn to 256 and saying, because he lives. There may be a lot of things in this world I don't understand, but I do know with him I can make it. Let's sing this together. 256.
swing open yes. and the redeemed go marching in to their eternal home. What a day, what a day that's going to be. And I can only imagine because the scripture says, I have not seen nor ear heard. So I can't even hardly imagine what heaven is going to be. Walking on go, it's up to $1,000 an ounce here. Or at least the last word I got. And we're going to be treading on it, just walking on it as if it was nothing. But you know, all of that means nothing in comparison to seeing Jesus. Our Redeemer, because he lives tonight. He lives so that you and I can live tonight. And we can make it through to the city. It'll be worth it all. One of these days, all of the trials, all the tribulations, all of the things that we go through, they'll seem so small when we get up there. I don't know, but I don't think we'll even worry about them. We'll forget about them because of just seeing him will be worth it all one of these days. Praise his blessed name. So good to have everyone in tonight. Uh, not the most pleasant weather out there, but we're glad that you're here tonight. Most of all, we're glad that God is here tonight. And let's just gather in and let's worship him tonight. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise tonight. And I, we need to do that every time that we come. We ought to be coming because we're wanting to worship him and praise him because he is worthy tonight. Let's go to prayer at this time. Let's continue to remember this revival, this particular service tonight, that God would just have his way in this service. He'd bless Brother Mitchell, if that's the desire of the Lord, that he would preach tonight and uh, just bless him and use him. Let's continue to remember uh, some of the requests I've been giving night after night. Geraldine Francis, uh, Haiti, the victims down there, Brenda Enlow, Sister Grile, Becca Stratton, the uh, Gillum family, uh, Amy Blackburn's uh, brother-in-law that is missing, has been missing for a while. Let's continue to remember him. Let's remember Ken Smith tonight, a friend of yesteryear, dying of cancer in the hospital. Let's remember him especially tonight. Let's remember Ken Reed tonight in our praying. You, some of you may not know these, but God does. God knows about every one of them. And uh, let's remember them tonight. Do you have any outspoken requests that you'd like to make known tonight? If not, I'm sure we all have souls on our heart tonight by an uplifted hand, and he sees each one of them, what they mean tonight, too. So good to have David Seeley here tonight, a former graduate of this school, pastoring at uh, the Pilgrim Nazarene Church down in the southern part of, of Indianapolis. Let's stand as, as Brother Seeley would come and lead us to the throne tonight. Father, tonight we're so thankful for the privilege of being here. We thank you for the praises that we've been able to sing in your presence that we've sent here tonight in the singing. And Lord, we're just coming to you, Lord, tonight to worship and adore and lift up the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that if anyone is here for any other motive, dear God, than to lift up the name of Christ, that, Lord, you would redirect our hearts and our minds and refocus our hearts upon the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come to you tonight as beggars, Lord, knowing that all that we have and all that we ever hope to have have comes alone from you that we have nothing of our own to offer but all that we can ever dream of must come only from your hand and we ask oh god for your grace tonight for we need your grace we ask for your strength tonight for we need your strength we ask for your blessing we ask for your help we ask for your glory and your grace and your all that you can give us lord we pray for your anointing upon this service tonight as brother mitchell brings the word of god that you've laid on his heart we ask you god to pour out your blessing and your power upon on him as he preaches the word and we pray that each one of us would have open hearts to hear and, and understand the word and receive it with gladness and joy and may it bring forth fruit in our lives we pray lord you know the unspoken request tonight each and every one that's so dear to the hearts of those that lifted a hand for prayer lord you know these needs tonight and you know those that are sick tonight and those that are not able to be here father and lord those that are suffering from cancers we pray lord for your blessing and your help in each and every request dear lord tonight you know each 
each need tonight, Father. Lord, we're not coming to a God that doesn't care or understand, Lord. We're not coming to a God that we have to carry around with us, Lord. But we're coming to the God that carries us and lifts us and strengthens us, Lord. And we want to worship you tonight and praise you and lift you up for you're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our glory. And Lord, we just want to lift your name on high tonight. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. We adore your name for you're worthy. And oh, we pray that all that is said and done tonight would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you tonight. May we be Christ-centered in all of our lives. Lord, we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I do thank you for your giving. God has been helping in a special way, and we appreciate his help. We're about $300 short of our goal for um, the expenses for this revival. Um, if uh, you all dig deep tonight, we can probably make that. So do the best you can. Um, that means that tomorrow I start on something else, so don't, uh, don't quit. I don't think that that's the end. Uh, I would love to be in a position that uh, happened in the Old Testament one time when they told the Israelites, don't bring any more money, we've got all we need. I'd love to be in that position sometime, somewhere, somehow, but I'm not there yet. So uh, give everything you can for God's glory. Amen. Brother Asbury, could you pray for the offering, please? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we're meant together in your presence again tonight. We pray that you will bless throughout this service. Pray that you're anointing beyond the uh, speaker, Lord, tonight, and that you'll have your way in this offering and in every part. We ask in Jesus' name.
Everybody enjoyed that? Say amen. 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 I appreciated that. I don't know what it is. It's probably just me, but I tell you, I, I believe these people that play the violin and, and the cello and things like that are some of the most nervous people I've ever seen in my life. Do you ever notice it? Do you, you notice that one hand shaking? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't understand it. But uh, they seem to be nervous about it. But Ethan, if you practice a little more, maybe. No, that's it. He is tremendous, and I appreciate it. I'm only kidding. But uh, we certainly do appreciate that tonight. Let's keep our hearts open tonight. We've got a special treat for you. Uh, they haven't practiced, by the way. Let me, let me put a disclaimer in there. But they don't need to practice too much. The Mitchells are going to sing for us tonight. Let's just open our heart as they come and minister to us in song. We'd like to thank Brother Glick for the big, the big notice tonight. 6.55, we found out. You agree with that tonight? Amen. I'd do it all over again. Only one thing I'd change, I'd probably do it sooner. Probably do it sooner. What a wonderful life. Didn't say it would be easy, but it's a wonderful life. And when you think of the alternative, it is wonderful. And I appreciate that song tonight. Let me just say real quickly that Brother Mitchell has authored a book, a brand new book, uh, that, that is soon to be printed, and the title is What Laymen Wish Their Pastor Knew. Quite an interesting topic. On the back of this thing, there's a whole list of topics that he'll be covering in that, in that printing, and if you'd like one of those, 
They're out on the table there in the foyer. They're $15 and that includes shipping and handling. And uh, you see the Mitchells after service. I'm sure they'll sign you up and get you one uh, when it's printed, which is not too far in the, in the future here. Also, each night we'll, we record and each day we record the services on CD. If you'd like to take the whole complete package home or just a particular service that you enjoyed throughout this service, there's forms out there uh, for uh, order of those and, and the piles will take care of that, Sister Pile, and she'll get them to you just as quickly as she possibly can and send them to you. So avail yourself, take it home, uh, and just listen to it again and again. Some of these sermons need to be listened to at, at time and time and time again. And because uh, sometimes we, uh, we miss some things, but they've been powerful and you just sign up for that. Let's also remember revival again right on down through each night at 7 o'clock, uh, right on down through Sunday evening, and uh, we appreciate your faithfulness. Some of you have been here every night, and we certainly appreciate that. Some of you just missed a night or so, and, uh, but we welcome you back. But if you can't come, you pray for us each evening that God would just manifest himself in a, in a powerful way, and he has done so. And then chapel tomorrow is our very last chapel day. My, how this week has just flown by. But uh, if you can, we did have some outsiders today come in. And if you can do that, we'd welcome you. Also, those of you that are association members, remember 930 Saturday morning uh, over in the chapel. We'll be having an association meeting. And uh, we, we encourage you all to come. Again, we're having a lo local IH convention here, February the 15th through the 17th. Pray for that, attend, and come and support, and I'm sure God will bless you for that. Also, uh, April the 1st and the 2nd, we're going to be having an Easter program. We, we annually do a Christmas program, and people love it, and we, we just, uh, good response, tremendous program this year. At Christmas time, we don't always do an Easter program, but we are this year. Brother Glick finally got motivated, and uh, he just, uh, I don't know what inspired him. Uh, something's wrong with him somewhere, but he, I'm glad he did, because I, I enjoy it. And uh, you'll be thrilled. You'll be, you'll be blessed. So put that on your calendar, April the 1st and the 2nd, a Thursday or a Friday night. And I'll always, all of our services in the evening are 7 o'clock. So put that on your, your calendar. Also, this school, uh, I'll tell you, we, uh, we're in need. We, uh, we take cash, check, credit card, debit card, food stamps. And now we've even stooped so low, we'll take your blood. Seriously, seriously. February the 5th at 12 o'clock. Four to through four o'clock, we're having a blood drive. No, seriously, we for two years in a row. The first two years we participated, we we uh, came in first place in the state of Indiana with the schools, and we reaped five thousand dollars each year for that. That was tremendous. Last year we fell a little bit behind, and not by much, from what they tell us. Uh, we came in second place, so we'd like to regain first place. It helps us financially, and you're helping mankind by giving your blood, and we'd encourage you to come, sign up, and uh, that's uh, February the 5th at 12 o'clock noon uh, to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Also, Brother Pickett, our principal, uh, got some notification from an association of schools that we belong to, and he talked to me about it, and I felt uh, led to do this. I encouraged our, our students this morning in chapel. Uh, all of you know about the tragedy and the trauma that has taken place in Haiti. And I know we're not rich, students aren't rich, we're not rich, but we feel like we want to try to do something for the need down there. And many times in the chapel service over there, they take up offerings, uh, and, and especially in the elementary, uh, and you'd be surprised what they take up in a year's run. 
Now this is not going to be a year, but we've encouraged our students next week to give towards relief down in, in Haiti. And if you'd like to participate, we'd, we'd like to invite you to participate with us. You can just put a, a, an offering in, a, in the uh, offering plate designated as Haiti Relief. It will be going to Holiness uh, Works down there. The ICHA has uh, Haiti work. We have two different works down there. And we have designated that whatever we collect is going to go to the Holiness Work of the ICHA there in Haiti. And uh, I can assure you with no uh, hesitation that every dollar that you get, it will not, there's no administrative cost like, and I'm not against uh, some of the other organizations uh, like United Way, but so much of that goes into administrative costs and only a fraction of the dollar gets there. But I can assure you that every penny that you give it will go straight to the Haitian missions down there. So we'd encourage you to join with us as we uh, endeavor to help a, a people that is in desperate need tonight in Haiti. And let's remember them in prayer tonight. And that's all the announcements I got. And everybody went, Phew. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm tuckered out now. I'm going to go sit down and let this new group sing. You t I talked about Ethan being nervous. This is the first time this group's ever sang publicly. So I'm excited, and they're scared to death. Uh, but I like to watch them when they're scared. No, I'm, who knows? One of them may pass out. I doubt that. But let's just, uh, we're excited about our new groups when they, when they formulate and uh, how they evolve, and the Lord blesses them. And we're expecting good things out of this group. Sounds of praise. Let's. Worship as they minister to us tonight. <clears throat> so good to be in revival tonight. Amen. And uh, we just want to praise the Lord. It's just so good to be here. And what we're here to do is seek His face. Just 
guys appreciate it. I think they're keepers, don't you? Yeah. Amen. They're, we're excited about our new groups. Let's just keep our hearts open again tonight and uh, as Brother Mitchell would come and uh, you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. I'm confident of it and uh, let's just join in as Brother Mitchell would come and ministers to us tonight. I've appreciated the ministry of Brother Mitchell, haven't you? Night after night and chapel after chapel, he's brought the truth. Well, let's just open our hearts tonight. Thank you, Brother Whitaker. Let's stand together and look at the book of Romans. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just had to do that. It's, uh, it was good to hear the group sing tonight. I think they're doing great, don't you? Yes. And I don't know if they practice that, especially for this service, it's just to match my message, but it sure does go along well. It's always a little uh, painful, though, when you begin to see the children that you had in kids' camp in college and uh, other times. I uh, thought about the, the young man that led the singing tonight. Jonathan, is that right, Jonathan? I want to call him Gerald Jr. when he leads. He looks like, like his dad. But I remember when we were in the early days of the ICHA, the Glicks were the singers in, uh, in a camp meeting there in Anderson. And, and we were watching Jonathan at night while they were uh, up on the platform. He couldn't be left alone. He couldn't be trusted. And... Uh, we promised him everything. We had an arsenal of candy and showed it to him before uh, uh, church that he could have if he would behave. And uh, he did real well. But we got, uh, it just, uh, to me, it just seems like it can't possibly be that he is leading the singing and doing such a great job. I'm so proud of all of our kids in a, in a good way. And I'm so thankful for what God is doing. And this, this group of boys did a great job singing seek my face. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will come tonight and continue your work here. We're thankful for everyone that's gathered in. Lord, we're thankful for those that are listening over the waves of the internet tonight and those that will pull this message out of the archives someday and listen. We pray, Lord, that your will will be done. We pray that you'll come and help us. We never learn much to preach on our own. We depend upon thee. May thy will be accomplished and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Seeking God's face. It's a work of true intercession whereby someone is able to cause mercy to flow in someone's behalf from the very hand of God. And even it's possible according to scripture to reverse a decision that God has made and cause him to change his mind 
concerning an individual or a nation. Very few people in Holy Scriptures were able to do it, but some did. I'd like tonight to continue this thought in the book of Exodus chapter 32. This morning in the morning service we preached along these same lines and we talked about Elijah and when Elijah brought the young child back from the dead and all that transpired during those days of his staying with the widow there and all that that was about and again tonight we want to look at someone else who were, was able to turn the mind and heart of God towards a nation we think tonight of Moses in Exodus 32. Moses is up on the mount of God and uh, he is there taking care of business with God. God is talking to Moses and uh, he is delayed somewhat on his return back. And that's where we take it up here in chapter 32, beginning with verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, notice that's little g there, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And so we have here a very ugly picture. First of all, I don't really think they knew how long Moses was to be up on the mount. I don't think Moses knew. I don't think God had let them in on that at all. And uh, for them to, to figure that it was time to declare Moses dead and say he wasn't coming back, I think that was a little premature. And I noticed something else here. They're crying for gods already. They're crying for gods and they've got a bad attitude. Notice here, uh, this verse reeks with attitude. It says, this Moses, this Moses, they're talking here about their leader. They're talking about the man that by the help of God has brought them out from under the thumb of the Pharaoh who's going to take them into the promised land. They're talking about their leader here as if he's just an old hat to be cast aside. They're not willing to wait a little while for him. They're ready to declare him history and to go on. And to do this, they're looking for God's. First of all, let's suppose that Moses is dead. <coughs> let's suppose that something's happened to Moses. Moses may be dead, but God isn't dead. They're crying for God's here. God's still on the throne. And by, and, and by the way, how many gods would they have? How many human gods does it make to take the place of the true and living God? America's yet to find out. And in verse 2, we have a very spineless individual that's brought back onto the scene of action. His name is Aaron. He is the brother of Moses, and he's one of the most spineless individuals in Holy Writ. Notice here what we read about him in verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And let's stop there for a moment. Aaron just seems to jump on this thing, doesn't he? He doesn't even say, well, I'd like to meet with some of the elders and see what they're thinking about this. He just jumps right on this thing. It's almost like he was waiting for a chance to jump into the chair of Moses, doesn't it? And later on, we'll find out in Scripture. We won't tonight because we'll not go there. But later on in Scripture, you'll find out that Aaron and Miriam uh, 
about what their true hearts were. They were jealous of Moses. They were jealous of Moses' leadership. And there came a time that Aaron and Miriam got into a big way about challenging the authority of Moses. And so early on here, we're already seeing this business that Aaron is wanting to jump into the seat of Moses. He wants to be somebody. But yet he doesn't know how. He doesn't have the moral fortitude to be the leader. And there are people like this around. If you ever hear that I have been elected chairman of the ICHA, you will know that it's happened at spear point or gun point. Number one. Number two, you will know that I probably lost my mind. I have no desire whatever to be chairman of ICHA. I, I was called to preach. I don't have administration abilities. I have no desire to climb into Buddy Perry's chair. None. And yet we see people around that are like that. They're hoping that they'll be nominated. They're hoping someone will bring them up. Listen, anybody that's that anxious to get in, you better hope they don't. Enough said. He becomes a willing participant in this craziness. He makes no attempt to stop it at all. In fact, he becomes the participant willingly. A false leader and the fashioner of a golden calf. Look at verse 4, chapter 32. And he received them, that's all their jewelry, at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Aaron should have said, Wait, 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 this has gone too far. This golden calf hasn't brought us up from Egypt. It's not really our God. But he had made the crazy thing. He wanted this to go over. And it did. And when they brought it up, he builds an altar for it, of all things. So now not only are they worshiping this golden calf, they are forgot about Moses, their leader. They forgot about God, their heavenly father. And they're giving this silly calf credit for bringing them up out of Egypt. Craziness. But I want us to notice what goes on here. It says, if you'll notice how many he's are in verse 4, you can see what's going on here. And he, Aaron, received it after he had made it. And then on down, verse 5, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar. He, he, he. You just go down through there. This thing's full of Aaron. It's full of Aaron. It's Aaron's brainchild. He's taken this thing even further than you can imagine because there's something ugly in its heart and it's called jealousy. There is jealousy in the movement tonight. There are people that are jealous of each other. There are preachers that are jealous of one another. They're jealous of others' ministry. They're jealous of somebody else. It's an awful thing. It's ugly. But it's true. And Aaron's jealousy is coming out here. He's building an altar. He's getting up early the next day. And uh, he says, you know, really... He says uh, uh, beforehand, he says, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. It is not. It's not a feast to the Lord. It's a feast to Aaron. It's a feast to the golden calf. It's a feast to all the self and the carnality of all of these people. It's all about them. God isn't around. He's nowhere around. Notice here in verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow. I mean, they're anxious now. They're getting up early, this crowd. And offered to burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and rose up to play. Hmm. What is all this? In verse 19, we'll fast forward here. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. 
And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the, ta the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Verse 25 says, When Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. These people have rose up to play, and they're not playing drop the hanky. They're naked. God's people. Say, well, they weren't really naked. It's a figure of speech. Depends which commentary you read. I've read several. And none of them really totally agree, but most of them believe that these people were naked. Moses saw they were. God saw they were. And so here we got people that just a few hours before were worshiping God, and now they're dancing nude around this golden calf. The Bible says God's got an attitude about that. Let's go back to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt. Look at God's attitude now. He's not saying my people are called by my name. He said your people. Your people. That's what your wife says when your little boy is in trouble. Uh, honey, your son's in. <laughs> about that. God says that those aren't mine. I don't know who, I don't know who these people are. They're, you, they're yours apparently. You need to go down and see about it. When I was pastoring in Greensburg, Indiana, in the Church of the Nazarene back in the early 80s, we missed Andy one Sunday morning. And, uh, and I said, honey, where's Andy? She says, well, I don't know. And he, it was Sunday morning. He was dressed in a three-piece suit. Well, back then, they had vests. I noticed they're coming back. And uh, I looked around, couldn't find Andy. And, and uh, I walked around behind the parsonage. And Andy was in a kiddie swimming pool out there a little three foot around pool. He was in that with his three piece suit on and he was having a great time. And I went back around the church and I said, uh, she said, did you find him? I said, yeah, yeah, your son's out behind the parsonage and he, he needs you, he needs you. You know, uh, God has an attitude. He says here, he says, get thee down, thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf. They've worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. God had seen the whole thing. He knew what they were doing, and he had disowned them. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. One old preacher from Kentucky said they were stiff-necked. <laughs> it's an awful picture. It's an awful picture when holy people start acting like heathen. It's an awful picture when you can't pick the holiness crowd out of a crowd. It's an awful picture. Look what verse 10 says. Now therefore, this is God speaking now. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. He says, Moses, just stand aside and let me just consume them in a moment, and I'll make you a great nation, and I'll take you to the land that flows with milk and honey. You know what? There wasn't any self in Moses here, was there? Boy, he'd have picked right up on that. He'd say, whoa, that sounds good. Because there were times that Moses was fed up with those people too. And, and rightly so. But no, we see a different side of Moses here. Moses besought the Lord, verse 11, his God, and said, Lord, 
Why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Listen to Moses. He says, none of this my people stuff. These are your people. Why are you angry with them? You brought them out of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. They're your people. God, you can't give up on them this easy. Look at verse 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak? He says, what are the Egyptians going to say when they hear you wiped everybody out out here? That's going to go over big. You know, Moses just talking to God. For mischief he did bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. And then Moses says, look at this. He says, turn away thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Wow, these are strong words. And I don't recommend you try this at home. <laughs> strong words, strong words. This is one of the most remarkable verses in the Old Testament. A man telling God to repent. That's almost scary. And yet Moses does it with a heart. God knows the heart. And God saw the heart of Moses. And then Moses clinches this thing. After he calls for God to repent... He says, God, calm down. Wow. Turn away from your fierce wrath. God, I'm putting you in time out. <laughs> Sounds funny, but folks, it was serious. God could have said, what? Who are you to talk to me? Boom. <laughs> In verse 13, Moses, I think, with tears on his face, says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob? He says, If I remember right, you promised them some things. You swear to your own self, and there's no higher power. And said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And this land that I've spoken of, will I give it to your seed and they will inherit it forever. God, you can't go back on that. You promised, Mo you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at verse 14. And the Lord repented. Wow. There's one seeker at the altar, and it's God. God has changed his mind. He's repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Folks, tonight, that is seeking God's face. It's scary to go there, isn't it? You better not go there unless you know where you're going and you know what your heart is telling you. Of course, when Moses came down off the mount, it's his turn to be angry now. Look with me at verse 19. We see it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables of stone out of his hands and break them beneath the Ten Commandments that God wrote with, the finger, with his finger. Moses is like, I'm out of here! Bang! Bang goes all Ten Commandments in one sweep. And Moses' wrath rises up. And God says, I'm going to have to put you in time out now. <laughs> oh my, but he didn't. God let him go because it was holy anger. 
he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon water and made the children of Israel drink it. They've been bad and they've got to drink the calf. You ever drank gold dust? I'd say it was pretty nasty. Let me tell you something. It's, it's a nasty thing when you've sinned the way they had. There's repercussions. These people are belching gold dust for two or three days. Gold wasn't made to eat. It wasn't made to drink. How did Moses come up with this punishment? I don't have a clue. And Moses said to Aaron, he gets Aaron by the nap of the neck and pulls him off to the side and says, What did this people unto thee? What in the world possessed you to allow this? What were you thinking in your wildest dreams? Thou, he points right at Aaron, he says, Thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. Aaron, I'm holding you responsible. And rightly so. Let me tell you something, preachers. The buck stops with you. Are you listening? Layman, where are you? We want a preacher who will stand up and tell it like it is. And we'll get behind him as layman and say, Thou said the Lord, I'm right behind you. We don't want a spineless leader who won't cry out against sin, who lets everything in. Let me tell you, this world is looking for a church where there's still a preacher who'll get up in the pulpit and tell it like it is and tell what sin is. They're sick of this wishy-washy church day and they're looking for a preacher who'll be honest with them. And Moses says, Aaron, you have failed. And Aaron says, oh, let not the anger of my Lord. All it was, it isn't this here Moses. He's now my Lord. Do not let the anger of my Lord wax hot. I guess by now they figured that Moses wasn't happy. He's broke up their their golden calf. He's burnt the thing to a crisp. He's beat it into powder. Can you see this old gentleman as he's pounding this calf? And every pound he preaches and tells them how low down they've gone. And they're drooping more and more under the conviction of Moses grinding now the gold and dust into powder. Calling for vessels to be brought to drink from. Everybody line up. We're going to have today by now they figured that something's up Moses is not happy you know what really folks if you have a pastor that winks at sin and doesn't care what you do you're in trouble if you go very many Sundays and your toes don't get stepped on you need a new pastor and you need to pray that God will make him brand new You listening? Okay, you're not. Okay, let's hurry on because we need to stop soon. Well, Aaron says, you know what? He says, you know, it's really funny how this happened. He says, the people started saying, up, make us gods which should go before us. As for this Moses, we, you know, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we we don't know what's become of him. And he says, well, yeah, I did. I said unto them, what so, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and out came this calf. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if you have art at this school or not, but there's not an art teacher here that will believe that. <laughs> that calf just didn't come out. He, he makes it sound like we throw the gold in and boom, out came the calf. Uh-uh. The verse said he fashioned it. He graved it with the tool. I mean, Aaron's is like, oh, yo, you didn't know I was a sculptor, did you guys? 
And everybody says, oh, we want sculpting lessons when we get to Canaan. Oh, show us. People are already signing up for classes. And he's loving it. But now he makes it sound like it, oh, it just happened. Oh, my. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked. He's, it was his idea. It's like this whole thing would be a lot neater with clothing optional. <laughs> what is going on? What's going on? Verse 26, Moses has had it. He goes to the gate of the camp and says, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of the Lord of, of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. You see, Moses knew they could not continue going the way they were going. There had to be a purging. That God was never going to be pleased with people that could do the heinous things that had been done on that particular day. And Moses said... Consecrate, verse 29, yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow a blessing on you this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. He wanted them to know, as if they already didn't by now, 3,000 people dead, drinking gold-laced water, Moses pounding the daylights out of a calf. By now they had a, an idea that something was wrong. You know, we're almost like that now. People act like they don't think the things they're doing is sin. Okay. Could use a little help tonight. Bad. Wouldn't hurt anything. He said, you've sinned a great sin. He said, I'm going to go up and talk to the Lord and we'll see what he's got to say about an atonement for you. These people needed an atonement. And Moses returned unto the Lord. Now here's the part that we must hurry to and, and, and skip right on down the road. It's the prayer of Moses. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, you know the kind of exasperated oh that you say? when you realize the kids have just destroyed the house in 15 minutes. Oh, Moses says, this people has sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Moses knows how angry God is. He says, yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin. Do you see the line there? He don't know what else to say. He doesn't know how to finish the sentence. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin. And if not, God, if you decide not to forgive them, blot, I pray thee, me out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses is taking on the sin of these people on his own shoulders. And he says, God, we're here together. If you won't forgive them, just blot me out of your book. Strong statement. Yet, now, if thou wilt, verse 32, forgive their sin, and then look down what it says in verse 33. Let me get down to there. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Here is the law of God. Here is the law of God that's standing yet today. God says you're going to be judged on an individual basis. Every one of these people, if they've sinned, they'll be blotted out. Moses, if you sin, you will. Whoever sins gets blotted out. Remember that.
when you're tempted to believe that we sin every day, that we always sin, God says people that sin get blotted out. Wow. Moses prays a prayer, and it's, it's just unbelievable, really, as we begin to look at it. He begins to tell the people, and he begins to talk to God. You know, Aaron calls his, the business mischief, but God calls it something else. You know, really, I'm thinking tonight, and I, I wrote it down, but I've got it written in the wrong place, and I, don't, I can't take you there because now I've lost my place for this. But I want to tell you this. I believe tonight with all of my heart that God wants to do something for people. He's interested in helping people, but He wants yes. them to obey Him. And so we must hurry on tonight as we go to the next thought. Let's look in Exodus 33. God tells Moses something that is shocking. The Lord says unto Moses, chapter 1, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt into the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. God says, here's the plan. I'm going to send an angel before thee, and I'm going to drive all these people out. I'm not going through all that whole list tonight. You can read it there. Verse 3, into a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. God says, Moses, I've changed my mind. I'm not going. These people are stiff-necked. I'm going to send an angel ahead of you to lead the way. But I'm not going because I fear in my great wrath that I will consume them if I go. I'm not going on the trip because I'm going to be tempted to consume them over and over because they're so stiff-necked. And again, the cloudy pillar comes be over the tent door in verse 8, the tabernacle. And every man looked, it says, after Moses till he was gone into the tabernacle. And I mean, these people are trembling in their boots. They've been told by Moses, the Lord said, Don't you dare put on your ornaments today until I decide what I'm going to do with you. I mean to tell you, he's laying it out. And it says there, they believed him. Look at verse 4. And no man did put on his ornaments. Yes. Therefore now, verse 5, put off thine ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. He says, there's not going to be any dolling up today. I'm deciding what to do with you today. Wow. And so the Lord talked with Moses, verse 9. It came to pass as Moses entered to the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. I mean to tell you, everybody's in prayer meeting. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh to his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. He says, God, I've got a problem with this. You've not told me what's going on. You've said you're not going. I don't know how I'm going to go. And yet you said to me that you know me by name and that I've found grace in your sight. Something's up with this. If you love me, if I found grace in your sight, look at verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now the way that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. 
Moses said, I, there's some stipulations here that I want to talk to you about. If, you've, if I've found grace in your, shot, your sight, show me now the way that I may know thee. And in verse 14, God said, My presence shall go with thee and give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. God, he says, if you aren't leading us, I don't want to go. You know, that should be our cry. God, I, I'm not going to go down and pastor this church by myself. If you're not going with me, I'm just going to stay at the house. And God turns around in verse 17. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Okay, Moses, I'll go. Moses steps out on a limb. You know what? He's bolder than I am. He has another request. He says, you know, while we're here, I want to see your glory. You know, Moses is thinking to himself, God, the minute I get out of this tent door, I've got to deal with this crowd. And I've got to have something to hang on to in the future. Listen, young man, you better know you're called to preach. You better know you're sanctified when you head out. Yeah. You're going to meet some people that aren't too cool. They're not going to like your ideas. They're not going to like your methods. You're going to run into some carnality somewhere. You may run into a church boss. In fact, you will. Get the book. <laughs> You will. And when you do, you've got to know God sent you there. You've got to know how to deal with these people. You've got to know how to help them and lead them. You can't put adults in time out now. You have to know how to deal with them. And you've got to know that you've seen the face of God. He says, I want to see your face. And God says, now you know that's impossible. He says, no one can see my face and live. That can't happen. And the Lord says, well, okay. This is amazing to me. You see, God and Moses are so close that God says, ah, All right. I tell you what, there's a place over here by me and you're going to come over here and stand on this rock and I'm going to have my glory pass by and when I do, I'm going to put thee in the cleft of the rock. There's a hole in the rock. It's a cave. Go stand in the door. When I come, I'll put my hand over the door while I'm passing by you and I'll take away my hand and when I pass you'll see a little bit of my back and that that'll be enough trust me that'll be enough and it was chapter 34 look at verse 29 and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony yeah God says you know the tablet you broke the other day Moses says yeah He says, I'm going to give you another set. Don't do that again. I wrote another set for you. Here they are. Take better care of them. Put them in the ark. Can't do that. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, verse 29, chapter 34, with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, he came down from the mount. Moses wist not. He didn't know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh. They knew Moses had been with God. Oh, if there's anything our laymen want, they want to see a, a boy or a man with a shining face step out of the study door and onto the platform. 
They want to know that you've been with God. They want to know when you preach that that message has touched your heart somewhere in the study. That you just didn't get up on Sunday morning and pull it up off the internet. They want to know you're feeling it. They want to know it's touched your heart. They want to know you've been with God. His face is shining. Three times in this chapter, verse 29, verse 30, and verse 35. And finally in verse 33, they said, Moses, we can't take it. Put a veil on your face. You're blinding us. But when Moses went to speak before the Lord, he took the veil off till he came out. When Moses and God got together for their chats, Moses took the veil off and he got renewed. You know what? If there's anything we need in the church, it's a Moses that gets with God often and takes down the veil until he comes out with a shining face. And his people know that he's been with God. The children of Israel saw the face of Moses, verse 35, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put a veil on his face again till he went to speak with him that is God. Moses was a man that could seek the face of God. And I have very little time. I'm going to touch on two things and bring this to a close. There, in Genesis 18 and 19, we see Abraham seeking God's face for his nephew Lot. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not even going to turn over there. Angels are dispatched in answer to his pleadings and drag Lot bodily out of the city because his uncle Abraham was praying for him and pleading with God for him. And in chapter 19, verse 29, it says, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out. In other words, God said, I can't do anything until Lot is out of there. Yes. Two of you angels are going to have to go and drag him out. Right. I can't do anything. Abraham's praying. That's intercession. Yes. In 1 Samuel 15 and 16, we won't go here because it's, it's, it's a whole story of its own. Samuel becomes an intercessor for King Saul. And it seems that God's heart is turned against Saul. It doesn't just seem it is. He has. And yet Samuel can't give up. Samuel follows Saul around and pleads for him. And God finally says to Samuel, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. God is ready to take Saul out of the picture. He's got David ready to put him on the throne, but he can't do it. Because Samuel is still pleading for Saul. Samuel's pleading for a change in Saul. He's trying to preach to Saul. Saul says, I've obeyed the Lord. Bah, murr. Samuel says, what is all that? You know, a true intercessor will call it like it is. With love. We've got to stop there. There must be more, though, about the intercession of Samuel and more detail that we really don't know about. Because in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 1, we read this. Then said the Lord unto, unto me. This is Jeremiah talking now. Okay, let's go through this. Who's talking? God. Who's he talking to? Jeremiah. What are they talking about? Israel. Jeremiah 15.1. Then said the Lord unto me. That's Jeremiah. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. God himself is putting Moses and Samuel in a class of intercessors all their own. God has had it 
with Israel. They're getting ready by prophecy to go into captivity for 70 long years and there's nothing that can be done. God says, Jeremiah, let me just tell you something. If Moses and Samuel were here, I wouldn't change my mind. God's put them in a space all their own because these two men were known as people that could change the heart and mind of God. When the face of God is turned away from a church, some churches are not blessed because they're stingy. And God will let them hold that big amount of money over to the side and starve a pastor out. He'll let them hold that big treasury out and starve workers and missionaries that come through. And he will let them get down to the place that they have to start dipping into their big money. And when they've dipped into their big money and they've used it all up, it will close. Some churches have turned God's face from them because of how they've treated their pastors in the past. You know, if your church has had 22 pastors in 24 years, you've got a problem. And you need to deal with it. Any amens? Amen. God's turned his back on some churches because they're stingy. God's turned his back on some churches because they've got carnal, carnal nature on board. God's turned his back on some churches because they're so worldly. Not necessarily in dress, but in the way they operate. God's turning his back on some churches. God turns his back on individuals that think they're high and mighty, that think they don't need to do this or that, that God has shown them. They have their own religion. They make their own values. They have their own rules. They won't join a church. They don't want to come or under anybody's rules. They're going to make it theirself, themselves. You know, I hesitate. I've never done it. Some people like to make their own wedding vows. That kind of scares me a little. You know, really, what does a couple 18-year-old kids know about writing vows anyway? Huh? Okay. Better go to another topic. <laughs> We've all got into this business that we want to be our own grandpa. It doesn't work. Right. Whenever the face of God is turned away from an individual, prayer must needs be coupled with seeking God's face for yes. mercy and miracle. Yes. Solomon! If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Let's stand together. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we are thanking you tonight for telling it like it is in the scriptures. You show us the worst and you show us the best. And Lord, tonight we pray that you will help all of us that we will learn to seek your face for churches that have depleted, for our nation that's forgotten you and kicked you out. For individuals that are hanging on the brinks of hell itself, we pray, blessed Jesus, that you will give us the kind of an intercessory ministry that we can pray our loved ones back from the brink, that we can pray dead churches back to life, that we can see a move of God in our midst. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands and be friendly. God bless you.